All right, we're going to get started in just a moment. So if everybody's ready uh, here and online, we will go right ahead. Okay, uh, so good afternoon, uh, almost afternoon, a few shy of that, I guess. Uh, thank you for joining us today for Legends of Tinker Field. Uh, my name is Jeremy Heilman. I am the assistant curator in the collections department here at the Orange County Regional History Center. I'd like to welcome everyone joining us uh, both in person and online uh, in our live webinar. Uh, I'll make sure to leave some time at the end for questions if you have them. And for those of us who, or for those of you who are joining us online, uh, feel free to leave questions or comments in the chat feature, and Cheyenne can relay those to me at the end of the program. So today we're here to talk about Tinker Field, uh, which was essentially Orlando's home for baseball for. 92 years. Uh, next month will mark the 100th anniversary of the dedication of Tinker Field. Uh, so that coupled with spring training and the upcoming baseball season um, just around the corner, uh, this would be as good a time as any to uh, kind of discuss the stadium's history. Um, Orlando is probably not the first place you th that comes to mind when people think of great baseball towns, especially people who don't live here. Um, we've never had a major league franchise um, and the amount of professional baseball our professional level baseball played here um, in the area has unfortunately continued to dwindle over the years. Um, but if you're going to talk about baseball in Orlando, a good majority of what uh, you're going to cover took place at Tinker Field. Uh, a lot of great baseball history happened here or there, um, but more importantly, some significant parts of our local history has ties to the old stadium as well. Um, so I am definitely not the first person to point this out. Um, there have been literally thousands of books and documentaries and scholarly research papers um, that cover this, but so much of America's history in the 20th century is really intertwined with baseball, um, and it absolutely can be a vehicle to kind of tell these stories, the important stories of the last century uh, and of this country. Um, so, you know, stories of economic development, uh, labor movements, and in the case of Tinker Field, uh, very much civil rights. Um, so I will walk you through um, kind of this piece of Orlando history, uh, touching on some of the legends associated with the field, both players and stories and, um, you know, people who are not players um, with the time allotted. If I don't get to your favorite team or person or player or anything like that, we can definitely talk about it at the end. Um, and uh, I think it makes sense to begin with the stadium's namesake, uh, Joe Tinker. All right, so Joseph Burt Tinker was born on July 27th, 1880, and spent his childhood in Kansas City, Kansas. That's Kansas City, Kansas, not Missouri, so important distinction there. Um, he began playing baseball for his high school team. Uh, he played on some organized regional teams before turning pro at age 19. Uh, he would play in several leagues before joining the Chicago Cubs of the National League, just before the establishment of what we now think of as Major League Baseball, which is the cooperation between the American and National Leagues. Um, this was the most notable period of his career. Uh, he played shortstops for the Cubs for 10 seasons from 1902 to 1912. And this time, the Cubs would go to the World Series four times uh, and win twice in 1907 and 1908. This is of particular importance uh, in the history of the Chicago Cubs, um, as 1908 would be the last time the team would win the World Series until 2016. So. 107 seasons is the longest championship drought in uh, Major League Baseball um, by nearly 20 years. Uh, and so the team that Tinker was a part of has a special significance to those fans even 100 years after the fact. Um, three of the star players on that roster hold um, a very special place in baseball lore. Um, Tinker as the shortstop along with second baseman Johnny Evers and first baseman Frank Chance were the subject of a poem called Baseball's Sad Lexicon, uh, which is also referred to as Tinkers to Evers to Chance. And the poem is basically a description of a double play from the perspective of a fan of the opposing team. So um, I imagine a lot of people here know about baseball, but just kind of a, a quick description of that, I guess, is uh, one of the most basic double plays consists of a batter hitting a ground ball to the shortstop. So that would be Tinker. Uh, who would throw it to Evers at second base to get the out and then to first to chance. So that would be kind of retiring two people in one play, the double play. Um, Franklin Pierce Adams wrote uh, the poem for the New York Evening Mail and it was published on July 12th, 1910. Um, it's actually cool because you can go back and look at the box score from the day before 
uh, and there's actually an instance of that happening. So he wrote it um, after the Cubs defeated his favorite baseball team, the New York Giants. Um, the poem has kind of come to represent teamwork and the sort of finely tuned athletic endeavor uh, that you know those three went on when they uh, played together. Um, but also from kind of the opposing side of that, it's seeing your favorite team lose. So there's kind of like a double-edged sword with that. So I've never uh, recited poetry publicly, but I'm going to read this poem for you um, best as I can. So these are the saddest of possible words, tinkers to evers to chance, trio of bear cubs and fleeter than birds, tinkers and evers and chance, ruthlessly pricking our gonfalon bubble, making a giant hit into a double, words that are heavy with nothing but trouble, tinker to evers to chance. So, okay. Um, anyway, so Joe would continue his career with several clubs, uh, the Cincinnati Reds, the Chicago Federals, or, and later Wales of the Federal League, and then again back with the Cubs. Uh, he served as a player manager during the later part of his career and ended up retiring as an active professional player in 1916. He owned a minor league team in Columbus, Ohio uh, for several years until 1920 when he moved to Orlando. So he was the manager for the Orlando Tigers of the Florida State League, uh, this was a really interesting time in Tinker's personal history. Uh, he comes to Florida. He's part of this winning team. He becomes successful in real estate, um, making a pretty substantial amount of money. And he had a real estate office uh, located at what is now 16 West Pine Street. So the photo on the left there. So this was most recently the home to Orlando Weekly. I believe it's still vacant after they vacated the property, but uh, it's still there. It still says Tinker up at the top. So if you ever want to go check that out, it's uh, kind of a cool place to visit. Um, so if you imagine Orlando, it's the early 1920s. There's not a major league baseball team here. And the star player from Chicago who's won four pennants comes down and really becomes like ingrained in the local community. Um, that's like a pretty pretty special thing. Um, there was a site on Tampa Avenue in downtown Orlando that had been used for baseball for several years up until this point, um, with Tinker having coached his Tigers team to a championship and his connections to baseball giving him the ability to persuade the Cincinnati Reds to make Orlando their spring training home. Uh, he became really like a civic hero in a lot of ways. So at the end of 1922, they began, began constructing a 3,500-seat grandstand that would be ready for the spring of 20, or I'm sorry, 1923, um, when it was officially dedicated Tinker Field on April 19th, 1923. So uh, the, uh, the stadium, this photo there on the right was a little bit after 1923, but you can kind of get an idea of what it would have looked like at the time. And then um, there in the middle is a picture of Joe himself, uh, pictured with his second wife, Mary, um, who was from Orlando, who he met in Orlando when he moved down here and uh, they got married in 1926. His first wife, Ruby, did move down to Orlando with him, but um, she tragically died a few years beforehand. Um, Joe's luck in terms of money would also uh, kind of take a bit of a turn in the mid to late 1920s, um, and then, uh, you know, in terms of the real estate business, and then with a lot of people who were financially successful at that time, um, the stock market crash later on would definitely impact him as well. Um, he would continue to toil around in baseball, coaching teams in the Northeast and here in Florida. Uh, unfortunately, his health began to decline in 1936. Uh, Tinker suffered from Bright's disease and diabetes, which eventually cost him one of his legs. And he died here on July 27th, 1948, which was his birthday. Um, so he died on his 68th birthday, and he is buried at Greenwood Cemetery. So you can see his marker there as well. Um, he remains very notable in the baseball world um, as a member of the National Baseball Hall of Fame. He was elected in 1946, just a couple years before he passed. And of course, his name in that poem. But also here in Orlando, um, that piece of land that carried his name uh, has done so for you know, almost 100 years it is at this point. So definitely um, kind of a notable thing here locally. So I mentioned uh, spring training. So I want to kind of go through some of the teams that, uh, that were here and kind of give you an idea of uh, you know, the progression of that whole sort of situation. So from 1923, the opening of the stadium until 1933, the Cincinnati Reds did their spring training there. Then um, in 1934 and 1935, the Brooklyn Dodgers were here. 
From 1936 to 1960, the Washington Senators did their spring training, and then after the 1960 season, the Senators left Washington, D.C., and that franchise moved to Minnesota and became the Minnesota Twins. Um, and they were here from 1961 to 1990 when they moved to Fort Myers. So that's essentially 54 years of the same franchise here in Orlando, which is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. So if we were to name all the teams that ever played at Tinker Field or called Tinker Field home, it would take quite some time. And I know a couple people have already mentioned ones that we're probably not going to get to too much. But um, I just, you know, over time, um, in one form or fashion, there have been teams from, um, you know, major league teams, minor league teams, summer leagues, senior leagues, little league, college teams, softball, all kinds of things that have, uh, you know, played in the stadium in some form. Um, so it would be really difficult to, um, you know, name all of them. But uh, there were teams, the Bulldogs, the Colts, the Senators, the Flyers, the Dodgers, um, a senior league team called the Orlando Squeeze, which I know is a particular favorite because um, that's a really cool name. And then um, the, uh, the kind of modern incarnation of what we think of as spring training where a team, or sorry, not spring training, but minor leagues, where a team would really kind of call the area home and be here and the public would go to the games and everything. Um, the Twins started here in 1963, the Orlando Twins. Uh, that progressed. They were here for quite some time until the late 80s. Then it was the Sun Rays, then the Orlando Cubs, which I see a gentleman wearing a very cool Orlando Cubs hat today. And then the last uh, team for the last couple of years was the Orlando Rays, and they ended up moving to the Wide World of Sports Complex over at Disney. So I mentioned that Joe Tinker was a member of the Baseball Hall of Fame. So you can see his plaque there where he's enshrined. And in addition to Joe Tinker, uh, there are well over 100 players uh, who played at Tinker Field who are now in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. So just to give you kind of a rough idea, um, including the people inducted this year, there are 342 people in the Baseball Hall of Fame. And that includes managers and executives. So that's a pretty substantial chunk of the Hall of Fame. I have heard it said before that all the Hall of Famers of the 20th century played at Tinker Field. That's not entirely true, but it's probably not super far off. So definitely an impressive list. So um, I'm not going to name all 100, but just a few um, before we get into some more in-depth stories about some specific players. But uh, players like Hank Aaron, Yogi Berra, Nolan Ryan, Honus Wagner, Johnny Bench, Ted Williams, Sandy Koufax, Roberto Clemente, Bob Gibson, Mickey Mantle, Stan Musial, Joe Morgan, Willie Mays, uh, and then, of course, the Twins players who kind of called this area home every uh, spring, Harmon Killebrew, Rod Carew, and Kirby Puckett. So very impressive list for sure. Um, and one of the most impressive that I feel like most people would recognize, even if they're not a baseball fan, is Babe Ruth. So in 1927, the Yankees came uh, for spring training. Uh, they played a game here on March 10th, 1927. Um, they would go on to win the World Series later that year um, and are const like pretty consistently listed as among the greatest teams ever assembled, that 1927 Yankees team. Uh, Lou, in addition to Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig was also part of that team, um, Hall of Famer in his own right, very famous player. Um, he was a six-time World Series champion, uh, just shy of Babe's seven. Um, and like, as I mentioned, they're both Hall of Famers, but Babe Ruth was uh, part of the first class ever elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1936. Uh, he held uh, very famously the records for the single season and all-time home run records um, for many years, and he is maybe the name most closely associated with baseball and is certainly a legend of mythic proportions. So um, in 1927, on this day, um, it was declared Babe Ruth Day, and uh, Ger J Jerry Herman, the president of the Reds organization who the Yankees were in town to play, paid for um, tickets for any Orlando age student ages 6 to 16 to come out and to see Babe Ruth. So I want to read uh, a little portion of this newspaper article uh, pertaining to that day that I think is of particular interest. Uh, it says, Tom Lance, superintendent of public recreation, has asked for 1,000 autos to convey the school children to Tinker Field. He asked that those with cars call 5982 and get stickers for their windshields, which say, jump in, kid, see Babe Ruth, free baseball. Drivers have been asked to go to the nearest school to pick up the boys and girls going to the game. So that's a pretty weird situation if you listen to it uh, in 2023. Um, so, but 
it kind of speaks to, uh, you know, the legendary status that Babe Ruth had achieved even in 1927. So kind of a, an interesting slice of history there and cool to think that Babe Ruth played at Tinker Field. So I want to discuss um, a couple of teams, primarily the Homestead Grays um, of the Negro Leagues who also played here um, in Orlando. Um, so the Negro Leagues refer to organizations made up of teams of African-American players and in some cases other players who were not welcomed into, into Major League Baseball because they were not white. Uh, the league had a well-established color line um, which lasted many years, that being Major League Baseball. So I know um, that's how these teams are referred to both then and now. Um, that word is a little jarring, uh, I know, kind of out of context. Um, so bear with me a little bit on that as we kind of discuss this particular team and some teams coming up here. But um, some players who played in the Negro Leagues would have a long enough career that they would eventually see the end of that color line and be able to play on Major League Baseball teams. But unfortunately, many of them did not. Um, although the circumstances which uh, prevented them from playing on the integrated teams were very unfortunate, many of the players themselves were elite level talents. Um, and even without that spotlight afforded the players on the major league teams, they really established themselves and those efforts are still celebrated today. So one of the most well-known teams uh, was the Homestead Grays. Um, they were from Homestead, Pennsylvania, and they played their home games in Pittsburgh. Uh, by the end of the 1930s, they started playing some home games at uh, Griffith Stadium in Washington, D.C., where the Washington Senators played. So that particular stadium was named for Clark Griffith, who was the owner of the Senators and later the Twins. Um, so that was really instrumental in because they called that stadium home in Washington, they were able um, to play some exhibition games down here at Tinker Field while they were training in town um, during the 1939 and 1940 season. So, um, you know, while the majority of the individuals that we're talking about today are in, that are enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame played for Major League Baseball, um, there are 39 people who played or worked for the Negro Leagues who are now also in the Baseball Hall of Fame, including three players uh, for the Grays who were present for all the games uh, in 1939 and 1940. That's Buck Leonard, Josh Gibson, and Ray Brown. So um, the, uh, the newspaper articles of the time kind of refer to the grandstand being roped off so that both white and black fans could come and see the game. So uh, we're still pretty far off in terms of uh, integrated stadiums and stuff like that in this area, but um, kind of interesting to note that this did go on at Tinker Field and is kind of a, a thing that I think sometimes gets lost when we're talking about the, the major league teams that played. Um, one sort of like quick aside from this that I do want to mention that I think is like really interesting is that um, in April of 19, so April 5th, 1939, a pretty notable game happened between the Homestead Grays and the Newark Eagles. Um, and the New York, e I'm sorry, Newark, um, they uh, were co-owned at that time by a woman named Effa Manley. And although um, there's really no confirmation that she traveled with the team for spring training was here at that time, um, she is a significant person in baseball history because she is the, has the distinction of being the only woman ever inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. So... Um, the co-owner of the Grays would be that, the single, single woman there. So kind of interesting on that front. Another very important player um, in the history of Tinker Field is Ray Dandridge. Um, so he is a Hall of Famer as well, but his name might not be as well known simply because he never played on a major league team. Um, he was a star in the Negro Leagues and in the Mexican Leagues during the 1930s and 40s. Um, and he holds the distinction of being the first black player to participate in an integrated game here in Orlando. So at the time, he was playing for a minor league team at the time called the Minneapolis Millers, um, who was an affiliate of the New York Giants. Uh, they played at Tinker Field, and in doing so, um, kind of was a very public example of an integrated event in the city before that became the accepted norm. Um, for that reason, Dandridge is a significant part of the history of Tinker Field, but also in Orlando in general. Um, over the next few years, more black players would take the field uh, in Orlando, but life outside the confines of the game would continue to be several steps behind, unfortunately. Um, because the hotels were not integrated, black players visiting town or even those who played for the Senators or later the Twins, um, who were conducting virtually their whole spring here locally, 
uh, were unable to stay with their own teams. Um, they also couldn't eat in restaurants with their teammates. Um, the difficulty of being a player um, who is not white at this time is immense. Um, just playing at a professional level um, for anyone would be very demanding and challenging, but then adding these kind of indignities is just a really terrible thing to think about. Um, as a ball player, you're traveling from city to city, you're constantly playing games, um, you're playing for different teams throughout your career on different levels, so you don't necessarily know like what you're getting into every time that you visit a new city or what it's gonna be like or what you're gonna be received as. So um, these challenges are very well documented and a really big part of baseball story, um, especially during the middle of the century. Um, and of course, I don't think you could tell that story without talking about Jackie Robinson. So um, I think it would be very difficult to argue that Jackie Robinson isn't one of or maybe the most important baseball player of all time. Uh, his skills on the field were obviously elite. I don't think anybody debates that. Um, as a major league player, uh, he was the 1947 Rookie of the Year. He was a National League MVP and batting champion in 1949, uh, six-time All-Star, and won six pennants with the Brooklyn Dodgers and the World Series in 1955. Um, but aside from his talents as a player, uh, he was also the first player um, to break the major league color barrier, playing in the first integrated regular season game on opening day for the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. So the courage to do this is obviously incredible, not only um, to perform as a player, but to do so with the weight of this responsibility on your back and the constant barrage of detractors, oftentimes um, you know, threatening your safety. Uh, Jackie Robinson in Central Florida may warrant like a completely independent lunch and learn at some point. Um, his time here, uh, the season before as a minor leaguer in the Dodgers system uh, in 1946 is pretty well documented, uh, both in DeLand and Sanford and some different areas and his experiences. But if you don't know much about Jackie Robinson as a whole, um, definitely a person worth, worth looking into. Uh, he played in Orlando for the first time on March 17th, 1953. Um, that was the first time that the now integrated Brooklyn Dodgers visited Orlando. Um, and as I mentioned, they had done some spring training here in the 1930s, um, but it would be until 1953 when they returned and Robinson was on the team. So the team was integrated, the stadium was not. A huge crowd of people turned out to see Jackie Robinson. Uh, attendance estimates range from 4,000 to 6,500. Um, but it was really apparent that a lot of black fans came out in large numbers. Um, they had to sit outside uh, the foul lines and in the outfield to be able to catch a glimpse of Robinson. Uh, Roy Campanella, another black player and future Hall of Famer, was also on the Dodgers by this time. Um, though more teams would integrate in the years following Robinson's debut, the, debut, the Dodgers seemed to really maintain their status as the most popular team among African American fans. So. Um, Definitely another big name up there that, uh, that played in Orlando and I think is a really uh, significant part of Tinker Field's history. So in 1963, um, the wooden grandstand at Tinker Field was really in bad shape, so they decided to construct a more modern arrangement. You see kind of the steel construction going into there. And that new structure would be built in time for the 1963 season of spring training. Um, the, the facade would kind of change a little bit over the years, but that main structure is what remained kind of throughout the history until the end of the stadium. So um, 1963 is kind of when that part was built. If you went there any time after that, that's kind of what existed that you saw. So um, this is not a baseball story, but um, this is another very significant thing that happened at Tinker Field. Uh, on March 6, 1964, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, spoke from a podium uh, in the infield at Tinker Field. And I imagine that most of you are well aware that King was a leader uh, of the civil rights movement and used his platform to fight against discrimination. Uh, he won a Nobel Peace Prize for uh, his nonviolent activism against racial inequality and was an outspoken uh, opponent of segregation. Um, he came to town at the request of Reverend Curtis Jackson, Jackson of the Shiloh Baptist Church. Uh, the two were actually classmates at Morehouse College in Atlanta. Um, the Florida affiliates of the Southern Christian Leadership Council were meeting at the Shiloh Church, and King spent the day there speaking to them and the local NAACP student group. 
Um, so just to kind of put this into context of what was going on at the time, uh, three years prior in 1961, uh, Mayor Bob Carr ordered all the racial specific signage from city ran spaces to be removed. Um, however, this action didn't just magically change things overnight as we all probably can imagine. Um, uh, so in 1963, uh, Black people could still not attend movies at the Beecham Theater. Um, and in that same summer, um, one of many notable examples of continued discrimination at public facilities um, was, uh, was occurring when the city actually shut down several public pools and beaches um, in response to a, blue, a group of black teenagers who had attempted to swim at Lake Fairview. So um, that same year in 1963 in August is when um, King's famous Washington DC speech, the I have a dream speech happened. So not terribly long before this uh, March 1964 appearance. So um, King was in Orlando uh, and spoke about integration and hope for racial equality in the future. Um, King would obviously appear in many cities and give many speeches during his lifetime. Um, this was the only time that he ever came to Orlando and about 2000 people came out to see him speak that evening. Um, and then, you know, kind of moving forward a little bit after this, so later that year, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 um, would be passed, uh, which would, in theory, end segregated public accommodations. Um, the same year, the Orange County public school system began to integrate, um, but it wouldn't be until 1970, until that plan kind of fully came to fruition. So um, these photos here um, were actually donated to the uh, History Center by Reverend Jim Perry. So on the photo on the right, uh, Jim Perry is the, um, or I'm sorry, the photo on the left, he is the furthest one on the right uh, speaking to Dr. King with two uh, other men that are not identified in the photo. And then on the right side, um, there's a group uh, posed with him and you can see Jim Perry um, second to last from the right there as well with Dr. King. Um, the people who were there for the speech or who got to meet uh, him that day. I think the significance of that time and having a person as prominent as King come during this, uh, you know, great time, I guess, you know, very uh, active time in the civil rights movement, um, and especially to the Paramore era specifically, uh, those kind of feelings can still be felt today. So King was assassinated on April 4th, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. He was only 39 years old. I know, um, again, that's very, uh, checkable online. It's not like something that people don't know, but just kind of to put that into context, like all that he accomplished in that short period of time. Um, there are murals in Paramore of Dr. King and the fact that he visited at that very specific time is a really important part of local history and certainly of Tinkerfield history. So um, definitely a, you know, a legend among legends worth noting, even though he was not a baseball player. Um, so in 1968, uh, both Joe DiMaggio and Eno Slaughter uh, visited Tinkerfield. So they had played there as players, but they made a special appearance after their baseball careers were over. Um, they were present for the dedication of a uh, plaque to honor Clark Griffith, who I mentioned earlier was the owner of the Senators and the Twins, um, who had passed away a few years prior. So um, he was really integral in keeping those teams here in Orlando for many years. Uh, he himself was a Hall of Famer. Um, and uh, just a, a very important part of Tinkerfield history. So um, Joe DiMaggio is definitely one of the most famous players of all time, so it was really cool that he was on hand and made the special trip just for that dedication. Um, he was a nine-time World Series champion, which is pretty wild if you think about it, 13-time All-Star. He has the longest major league hitting uh, streak to this day with hits in 56 consecutive games. And then if you're not a huge baseball fan, um, you know, there's some pop culture references to Joe DiMaggio, the song Mrs. Robinson by Simon and Garfunkel, and he was also married to Marilyn Monroe. So definitely a, uh, a notable person. Another person who is notable but not necessarily for his baseball skills is Michael Jordan. Um, so Michael Jordan played at Tinker Field in 1994. Um, probably the most famous basketball player uh, to ever live. Uh, there may be a little debatable, but definitely up there. Um, and he was not, again, quite that level of player as a baseball player. Um, he retired uh, from the NBA for the first time uh, after the 1992-1993 season and signed a minor league contract with the Chicago White Sox, where he would spend the summer of 94 uh, with the AA um, Birmingham Barons. Uh, he didn't necessarily stand out in terms of his play, but he attracted huge crowds everywhere that team went. 
Um, so when the team came to town to play the Orlando Cubs uh, in a three-game series that began on May 9th, 1994, the games were all sold out, um, which is definitely a rarity for minor league games at Tinker Field at that time. Um, and, you know, as many people are probably aware, he did not continue to play baseball, but he did return to basketball the next year um, to continue his dynasty with the Chicago Bulls, um, who won six NBA championships with him. And he was the MVP of every one of those six championships. So pretty impressive there. Um, his accolades are probably too much to mention, so I won't get into that. But um, he was elected into the National Basketball so or the, I'm sorry, the National Basketball Hall of Fame in 2009. So that's another Hall of Famer that we can kind of add to this list that's of major note. In addition to baseball, there was a lot of other events that happened at Tinker Field. Um, you know, over so many years, it's kind of hard to note that, but, um, you know, it really was a community event space of sorts. Uh, throughout that time, there were other venues, uh, you know, including the Municipal Auditorium, the Orange County Civic Center, uh, the Orlando Sports Complex, even later the Orlando Arena. Um, but there were plenty of uh, groups and organizations that decided to use Tinker Field to house their events. So you can see kind of just the variety of different things that were going on. Um, the Bahia Shriners hosted their circus there um, for a few years. This is a, a specific ad from 1963. Um, so the Bahia Shriners being the kind of local chapter of the Shriners organization. Um, there were some concerts you can see there. Um, in 1965, the Beach Boys played there. Um, and there were a few others, but not a ton um, during the time that the stadium was kind of active with baseball. So you would probably think that happened more often, but it did not. But obviously the Beach Boys, a big name um, that played there. Religious gatherings of many different varieties. Um, there was one that I thought was kind of interesting from um, this Break Free, Break Free 1993 event. Um, the program that evening was called uh, Marriage, When Does Love Need Help? Um, so just like kind of a, a weird mismatch of different things going on there. Political rallies, um, you see there, uh, Whitehair was a, uh, a candidate for governor in 1940. Um, they also hosted um, some closed circuit events, uh, including a 1965 uh, fight between Sonny Liston and Cassius Clay. So some of you probably know, but closed circuit TV was kind of, um, you know, the thing back then before cable television was really invented and before you could just kind of pull up anything on your TV and order a special event. Um, so that would be kind of the only way that you could see it if you weren't there live was to go to a theater or an arena of some kind that was had like a satellite feed of that particular uh, event, and in this case, a fight. So this is um, the sort of rematch between the two. Uh, Clay had defeated List Liston um, for the heavyweight championship the year before. Um, very controversial fight and resulted in um, maybe the most famous boxing photo in history. Um, fight lasted two minutes, um, and Clay would change his name to Muhammad Ali soon, so definitely um, a notable thing there. Uh, and then in 1989, just one more kind of oddity of a thing that happened there, uh, director Ron Howard, so Opie from Andy Griffith's show, um, shot a scene for uh, his movie Parenthood at Tinker Field. Um, the field doubled as Bush Stadium in St. Louis. Um, Steve Martin and Mary Steenburgen were um, at a St. Louis Cardinals game in the movie with their children, and they filmed in the stands and also in the parking lot. Um, they also filmed in many other areas of Orlando as well, so kind of a cool history. Um, so as I kind of alluded to before, in 1999, the last of the minor league teams moved away um, from Tinker Field, and in 1990 was the sort of last incarnation of spring training. So um, while the stadium did get used for baseball purposes from time to time with summer leagues, different things going on, um, it really was no longer synonymous with baseball. Um, the grandstands continued to slip into disrepair, and the space was used more as a festival ground than a stadium. Um, events were still held there on occasion. Um, the local rock radio station, WJR, had their Earth Day birthday there a few times. Vans Warped Tour came there. Um, and then in later, beginning in 2011, the Electric Daisy Carnival Festival um, started being hosted there on an annual basis. Also during this era, era President George W. Bush appeared twice for campaign rallies. Um, yeah, so a lot of interesting things kind of going on at that time as well. Um, but unfortunately, uh, you know, there would be the end of Tinker Field kind of um, 
in this era, I guess. So anyone who attended um, these type of events there would probably say the same thing, that the place was really kind of in sad shape and it was um, you know, not really functioning as a baseball field so well at that point. Um, many uh, residents and officials championed saving the stadium um, because of its histor historical significance, which we've kind of talked about a bit today. Um, but um, by you know, this time, it was kind of impractical. Um, the Citrus Bowl, so you can kind of see in that photo there, the um, previous incarnation of the Citrus Bowl uh, was um, renovated in sorry, 2014, um, and it expanded its footprint into the outfield of Tinker Field, so um, it really wasn't as usable as a baseball stadium anymore. Um, so with no real baseball-related usage um, that could justify the cost of restoring the stadium, uh, it was demolished in 2015. So the Electric Daisy Carnival and other festivals are still held on the grounds, um, and the space is still commonly referred to as Tinker Field. Uh, EDC is a massive uh, dance and electronic music festival hosted in town each year. Um, so the name Tinker Field does still pop up in the news um, for that, if nothing else. Um, President Barack Obama also spoke um, on the grounds um, during a campaign event in 2020. So again, things are still happening in this area. Um, it's just that the baseball stadium is no longer there. So Orlando City Commissioner uh, Regina Hill um, headed efforts to memorialize the stadium with a historic display. Um, the Haddock Family Foundation, specifically Ted Haddock, did uh, a lot of research into the history of the stadium, and that was utilized for the Tinker Field um, Plaza display, which exists there today, and here's a photo of that. Um, that research was also very helpful in preparing for this presentation today, so thank you very much for that. And then also thanks for um, you know, the efforts that went into making this, uh, this plaza that people can enjoy today. So um, if you've never been out there uh, since the kind of, um, you know, the removal of the stadium itself, it's a really cool little uh, plaza tribute there. Um, there's a timeline kind of history and then some more in-depth stories that you can read into. Um, there's also a list of all the Hall of Famers that played there organized by their position and they're laid out on the concrete in such a way so it resembles a field, so that's kind of cool to take a look at. Um, it also has that dedication uh, for Clark Griffith that I mentioned that Joe, Joe DiMaggio came down for, so that's there as well. Um, and there's also a bust and a plaque for Martin Luther King Jr. So um, I think, uh, you know, recognizing a place like Tinker Field is a really great example of, um, you know, the importance of local history. Uh, certainly isn't as famous as some of the, um, you know, the stadiums from back in the, uh, you know, the early uh, 20th century, like say a Wrigley Field or a Fenway Park in terms of like national prominence, but um, definitely played a huge role in our local community and really should be celebrated for, um, you know, both the athletic end of it and all the other history made there. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So if anyone has any questions, we can uh, answer those. Somewhere, yeah, so it's interesting that you mentioned that. So if you, um, if you go to that plaza, there are some of the original seats there um, at the plaza. We do actually have some of those seats in our collection. Um, they're not on display at the museum, but hopefully um, in some form or fashion one day that will be the case where either you know, as part of a, a special exhibit or, um, you know, a more permanent setup that we can get some of that stuff on display. We also have a few signs, not like a big, you know, Tinker Field sign, but, you know, kind of section signs and stuff like that. But I know um, after the, uh, the demolition, there were a lot of, like, private collectors who had, had seats and stuff as well. And what's kind of interesting, too, is that um, when they renovated the stadium in 1963, a lot of the seats that they used were from Griffith Stadium in Washington, D.C. that they brought down. So if you have some of those seats, um, you know, you kind of have that double history of being both from Washington and from Orlando. So, yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not repeating the questions. I need to do that. So he asked who uh, owns the facility now. So the city runs, like, the grounds, I believe. Like, there's not, other than this, um, you know, kind of memorial plaza there, there's really not much, um, you know, it's kind of like a large open field that can be used for like festivals and different things. They've used it for a lot of different stuff. So, um, yeah. So 
David asked if uh, there were plans to commemorate the 100th anniversary. I, I don't know, honestly. I don't know if there's going to be any kind of ceremony there. I would hope so. Um, we're still about a m- month and a half out from that. So if that is happening, I imagine that that'll be uh, kind of coming out in the news soon. But I, uh, regardless of any kind of like official event, I imagine that there will be people who kind of swing by that plaza that day. So it should be kind of a cool you know, day in history for sure. Yes, sir. Uh, the, um, when he passed in the 40s, he had a very humble gravestone yes. with his family. And in Greenwood Cemetery, I believe it was his great nephew that, uh, in partnership with the Chicago Cubs, they felt that was inappropriate. So recently, within the last five years, they have built quite a monument to him. It's just inside the gate about 100 yards where his grave is in Greenwood. And it's about the size of that black. Stand yeah, I would say about like, yeah. So he's discussing the uh, Tinker Memorial at Greenwood Cemetery. Cubs logo. Yeah, super cool. It's really, it's really nice. Hall of Fame plaque, and then all of his family members uh, mark around here. It's really worth your time to go out there, although there's, the cemetery is historic in its own way. Yeah, of course, of course. That in particular is very impressive. And it comes to life, as I understand it, you might have better tried to do the right thing. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting too, and I think that like these, um, you know, the teams now that have, you know, kind of the funds to do something like that, like letting you know people know the significance of their historic players, because you know somebody who played in the you know the teens, the nineteen teens, like that's there's not you know people who necessarily remember seeing them play anymore so it's kind of interesting to um you know use some of their success now financially to shine a light on that so i think that's really cool you will find people with baseballs baseball cards yeah i find that quite quite touching no i think that's great it's definitely worth checking out. There's a lot. So um, kind of reiterating some of the sites, I guess, that are still around. Um, you know, like I said, you can go to that plaza. The Tinker Building on Pine Street is still there with that kind of cool um, tile that says Tinker up at the top, and that has a, a plaque of distinction as well. Um, and then, of course, Greenwood Cemetery where um, Joe Tinker is buried. So if you're interested in that, there's definitely still some things to see locally um, that you can check out. So. Yeah, so from what I can tell, the, the plaque is the same. They've kind of altered the actual, like, um, the, the, the sort of structure that it's on. It's still very similar, but, yeah, I mean, that is still there at the Tinker Plaza now and, um, you know, looks very similar to what it did at the time. So, yeah, it's very cool. So that kind of flanks one side, and then the bust of um, Martin Luther King is on the other side. So kind of, you know interesting to check out there and kind of it's it's a really interesting display because it does kind of get into some of these things where it's not just a you know baseball field but it's a real you know kind of piece of um, civil rights history and the history of Orlando kind of in general and all the the different things that happen there so anybody else that's uh yeah that's a good point yeah they uh yeah, I mean that must have been pretty uh, pretty cool. So this gentleman's talking about the uh, the world champion Minnesota Twins uh, in the 1980s. So yeah, I, I see some twin stuff here. So that's definitely uh, that's definitely a cool cool piece of history. So yeah, and I, I think that's another thing with Florida is like um, you know it wasn't until uh, the 90s that we had major league teams that were actually you know called Florida home, but there were so many people in Florida who felt an attachment to different teams, like the, you know, other than people who live in the, you know, the Midwest or up in Minnesota, you wouldn't necessarily think that Florida was home to a lot of Twins fans, but, you know, that's the case. One of the sort of benefits of spring training is that there's so much, um, you know, affection for those teams who, who call the area home, at least during the spring. So another question. Oh wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, so he's telling a story about Carew 
and kind of being talked into um, not leaving baseball while in Orlando. So, yeah, and I, I will admit, you know, there are plenty of other stories that, you know, we could cover during this time. And if you're interested in, in that history, that's definitely out there for you to check out. And hopefully, you know, in the future, we'll be able to, to talk a little bit more about certain aspects of this. And um, But, you know, as far as celebrating the, the 100 years of Tinker Field, I think um, this gives you at least a little overview if you're uh, – looking for more information, it's definitely out there. All right. All right, yeah, thank you guys. So, uh, yeah, just thank you for joining us today. Um, we really hope you enjoyed the program. Um, supporting our programming is one of the best ways that you can support the History Center. Uh, we really appreciate you being here today. Um, if you want to learn more about upcoming programs or um, want to take a look at what other things we have going on, just visit uh, thehistorycenter.org.